beautiful place is also right next to what is now a golf course but was also called by the 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 colonial invaders at the time the native location where Organa people were herded into this area over here and kind of strongly encouraged to stay there or the old Adelaide jail was across the river so they could look at that and they or, and if you read the first governor's journal there was an enormous amount of violence that happened going up the hill towards Carclue and towards Colonel Light who's um, the statue is up on the hill over here, pointing out over the Adelaide Oval, saying, I will build here. So when we think about the colonial project and North Terrace, uh, which is the cultural precinct of um, this place, and also Adelaide in 1836 was set up not as a penal colony, but as a, a place where people in England could buy land sight unseen as a kind of like housing project. So there's amongst the Adelaide establishment of non-Indigenous people a kind of uh, an understanding of this free settlement here. So I want to acknowledge all of that and the fact that there is very little to memorialise a very, very violent history of this place in the physical landscape. So part of what we're going to be talking today is going deeply into that and what, what should we be doing institutionally, inside and outside of institutions to address those issues um, about the public narrative, about who gets to say what about who and how are those histories going to be told and who's going to tell those histories and how are they going to be taught in the schools. They're really important conversations. I'm going to hand over to the facilitator. Brilliant. Hey. Well, you, she doesn't need much facilitating. <laughs> Thank you, Ali, for that very, very powerful introduction. It's true. Give her a round of applause. I, I would actually love Ali to, to, given that beautiful introduction, I'd love her to talk through her, her practice, her, her projects, uh, and just give us a, a broad overview with those themes in mind. Okay. So, um, it's because of the circumstances of my great-grandmother and grandmother's life that I sit here today and I was raised by um, women who were descent, you know, uh, descendants of incredibly important people on the Nullarbor but also, and we're all important, but were also forced to be domestic slaves a, in this town and, you know, and part of, I went to art school because my mum worked with Annie Polly Sumner, who, if you saw this morning's um, presentation, my mum worked at the Aboriginal Medical Service and I didn't... I grew up kind of in and out of that Aboriginal Medical Service when I was really young and went on a lot of those protests which um, Annie Polly showed images of. Um, and so I spent a lot of time thinking about... But I didn't want to do health... Um, mainly because of the kind of... Ra the stories, the racist you know, state of a lot of these spaces. So I wanted to kind of, I was quite depressed and I wanted to study art and I thought that art might be a way to um, make me feel happy and that I could find joy. And what I found at art school was that I wasn't taught in, in the 1990s at the University of South Australia, I was not taught by any Aboriginal people for the entire four-year degree. Not one guest lecture... Um, not one Aboriginal lecturer, um, not, none of our community were considered to be authorities, even though it was a visual art degree and at that time. And so I looked to a lot of the artists that I've seen this past couple of days. I looked to um, people like Julie Goff, uh, people like Destiny Deacon, Brenda Croft, Hetty Perkins, all of the kind of Bumali movement that was happening on the East Coast. I looked at all of the kind of activism and the representation of that activism that was happening nationally and I, I just want to say how honoured I feel to be in the presence of all of you mm -hmm. at this time because, um, you know, in a sense that kept me alive at various times of my life, this capacity for us to make our creative work, the possibility of our freedom couldn't be denied to us in when we were making work and we were speaking back and we were flipping that gaze. 
And so, um, but I stopped making work after I left art school because I didn't want to talk about myself and I, I thought it was too individualist and it was too white. And I went to work with my communities um, at Flinders, in Yungarendi First Nation Centre and worked with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students for a long time and then I'd done a master's in screen studies and undergraduate visual arts and then I, um, I was enrolled in a PhD and I said to my sisters and I want to acknowledge I'm part of a collective of Aboriginal women artists who are all academics and we're all at that time trying to do our PhDs in a very potentially racist institution. I mean, all institutions can be potentially racist and all institutions in a way are, you know, to quote Fred Moten, are correctional yeah. and always trying to correct us. And in a sense, part of what I'd been doing was teaching our very violent histories to mainly non-Indigenous students. Uh, for 22 years I've done that. And... Um, thinking about race and racism and the impact of race and racism on our bodies and thinking about the canon, who gets to tell the stories, what, the story, what are the stories that are being told. And I said to my sisters, we're all really creative. We can do this. Let's break out of the institution. I want to have this conversation that's a lot deeper with each other and with our communities. And I want to bring it out of the university, out of the lecture theatres, out of the books and journals. So we got a grant and we did this, this work, which is part of the 2015 inaugural Tanandi. Um, and it was, so we'd been thinking, we'd all been researching in the archive and my family um, history is really, um, so I started thinking about um, Nellie and I's great grandmother, Gumilia, um, and I'd found out that there was a bust of hers in the South Australian Museum. And I thought, oh, Tyndale's carved her, how nice. But no, it wasn't a carving, it was a cast. And it was a cast of her face and her chest. And I guess part of the kind of shock of that, I don't know, and also that he'd taken blood or hair or that there was this huge collection of blood and hair and uh, old people's bodies and that these were all taken as part of this social Darwinist um, project to justify the colonisation of this country by making sure that everyone understood how primitive we were, how we were the missing link, how we were the lowest of the rung. And at that time, Adelaide, this little stretch where we are now, was... The, the nation's capital of physical anthropology, they were all flocking in and thousands of our old people. So when you hear Uncle Morgie talking about that or I listened to Bob Weather all the other day, our old people's bodies were taken from this place and shipped all over the world, thousands and thousands of them. And we're in the process of trying to bring these old people back but also the ideas that sit behind why they did that are really fundamental to the conversation about race that we need to have in this country. It's fundamental and it's also something that we can't do on our own. When you see our sports people or individuals taking on the tide of racism and foundational racism that this country is built on, the white Australia policy, assimilation policies, all of those policies of hatred and physical hatred of our bodies, how we unpack that has to be collective and we have to tell these stories in ways that are not just educating white people but transforming them for ourselves so that we feel differently about the way our bodies have been treated and also ha engage in ceremony that is healing for us. So part of... And it was really interesting yesterday listening to John Mundine talking about the fact that the War Memorial have half a billion dollars and won't acknowledge frontier wars as legitimate wars in this country because if they acknowledge that they were at war with us, then they have to acknowledge our sovereignty on some level. And that if we don't exist in that 
if, if our sovereignty is, is only in the creative area, it's like it's not real fact. You know, when it's in that museum, this is like scientific fact. This is proper historical canon fact. Whereas if it's in the creative arts area, it's like our creative, our activism is create, creative, is it? Our, activi our activism can only exist in creative spaces. Is that what we're saying? Is that what they're saying to us? Because that's the place where a lot of the, our truths are really coming out un, unmediated, you know, real um, slamming those truths out there. But I feel as though there's still this kind of um, silencing of our voices in particular kinds of ways. So we were, I was interested in what does it mean to be both inside and outside the institution. As Aboriginal people, we've been institutionalised so incredibly much. Every part of our, our histories and presence is about these institutionalisation and the people who police those institutions. You know, the social workers, the doctors, the lawyers, the um, psychologists, the uh, police officers, the criminologists, the judges, everyone who I teach in the university who goes out and then implements these rules upon our bodies. And the space of creativity is vital for everyone because we are over-institutionalised and we are becoming more so. And it is an incredibly difficult space to kind of work into. So I was thinking about what is the space between the institutions, this idea of public or common space, how are Aboriginal people still seen as outsiders in the commons of our, these cities and towns, how we're still pushed to the outskirts, how we're still homeless here, how we're still the poorest people in the city, in the, you know, and, and how do we feel in the institutions? And so part of this, and we've got this picture of Faye's hand slapping the State Library. So when my mum grew up, she couldn't find a book that could describe her as a learning person growing up in Ghana country that wasn't racist. She could not find one book that wasn't written by a white person and didn't somehow either exclude her completely, so we didn't exist, terra nullius of the text, or that had this incredibly racist description of who we are and not complex at all. So these are just ideas. They're ideas and we can change those ideas and we can change the cities that we live in and we can change the way that we operate within those institutions and we have to do that. And I, and I say to everyone and the white people that I teach, I say, this is not the time for you to not have a position. You must speak and you must be brave and speak because we're only 3% of the population. We need good allies. But you need to not be afraid of being called out or whatever. You know, if people want to call out your process, you, it's all about this, you know, don't worry about the politeness aspect. Just get in there and be grounded in your process and who you are. But I feel as though... So we honoured our families. We projected onto the walls. We made these skirts out of paper bark and flour and sugar and tea, ration skirts. They look a bit like colonial skirts. They also look a bit like cocoons that we could crack out of. Mm -hmm. Simone is a singer, a young Gunjara, um, you know, comes from a long line of song women. Her grandmothers were anti-nuclear activists. And she still is an anti-nuclear activist and we shout out to all the women who protect country. Natalie Harkin is a Narunga poet and incredible um, academic as well. Faye Roses Blanche is Yidinji Mabarbram, has lived on, in Adelaide for over 20 years and is an incredible educator, spoken word artist and filmmaker. And together we decided that we would just bring joy to each other and have this conversation which was inward facing and if people wanted to bear witness to it, they could, but it wasn't necessarily trying to scaffold white people in, but it was actually about what we felt about teaching our violent histories in institutions for such a long time, trying to thrash against the rising tide because every year I get the same response from 
non-Indigenous students coming into the classroom as young adults shocked that they haven't been taught any of these histories, that they know nothing about their local history. And I, and I ask the Education Department, what is happening? What is happening? Why is it the first time that they reach us that they're, they're having this experience with Aboriginal people where they are going deeply into our histories from our perspectives? Mm. Uh, yeah. So art is a great tool for that. You have the opportunity, of course, through these projects too, to inhabit, as you said, that space between it, but a space that was also central and heavily loaded, like our auditorium being the former archive building, the South Australian Museum, lawns, and also, of course, the library. So this sense of actually uh, interrogating those spaces to me was the, the, a really critical step for the work that went on to have national exposure, right? Yeah. So it was about, we started thinking about what if the, the record, because there's just, there's so many records on us. Like it's really, it's quite unbelievable. If you go to the South Australian State Record, they've got so many boxes of records. They've only got two archivists, Aboriginal archivists working in there. And shout out to all the Aboriginal people who work in these collections. That is like, hello, I appreciate and honour and acknowledge all of the incredibly difficult work that it is to work within an institution, to work within an institution and try to provide services to our communities which are vital. And I'm not, this is, you know, any. I, I want to predicate any kind of issue, because I work in an institution yeah. and, I, and I, it's a complex, it's you, you know, in terms of coming with solutions, there, it's a complex space to work inside and outside of. Yeah. And as Aboriginal people, we're inside and outside of the state. So when I asked, I had to write to the state to ask to ha access my family's records from the South Australian state records, right? And they sent a solicitor down there before me to check them. And that's because in this state, the only successful suing by a member of the Stolen Generations happened because the last protector of Aborigines was acting outside of the law. So people could successfully sue in this state. But at that point, I knew that the state wasn't protecting my interests as a citizen of this state. They were protecting the state white interests. And, and the Bruce Trevorrow case is an example of where the state fought that. And he died in the process. But we weren't represented there. So, you know, when we were talking about truth-telling, what about all the lies that, you know, what about all the lies and the, hard, the heartache and people who have died of heartbreak? How do you... You can't reparate that, you know. That's not something you can financially compensate. They are issues around ethics and our the way we want to have communities, the kind of communities we want to engage with, the kind of ethical relationships we want to have with the institution and how the institution will choose to honour its own, you know, the idea that knowledge production could be an ethical process. Yeah. Knowledge production should be an ethical process. Universities should be engaged in that, governments should be engaged in that, communities should be engaged in that. That is, I think, fundamental to the kind of society that I want all children to be a part of. Thank you, Ali. That's a really great opportunity for us to introduce Julie. No, this is beautiful. Thank Hi, Julie. you. Julie, we, I believe we can see you, but you can't see us. So what we might do is I'm going to drive for you, Julie, and drive the slides, if that's okay. And I know you're a pro at this because you did it beautifully yesterday, apparently. So we would love, feel free to pick up on anything that Ali has, has very powerfully introduced this morning. But also I invite you to talk specifically to the project Psychoscape that we've got the slides on. I don't um, yeah. quite know, team, how I get the slides back. Oh. <coughs> oh, you do it. Oh. Oh, they're on the side. Oh, they're in the little, they're in the corner, Jill. They're in the little box. But, um, Yeah. You can hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, here we are. Yeah. Fabulous. Great work. Thank you, everyone.
Over to you, Julie. Thanks so much. That's um, I just uh, everything that you said, Ali, was so incredibly powerful and gives us a lot to just reflect on for the next. You know, let's work through that really over the next few years to try to get things where they need to be. Um, so yeah, I'm firstly I'm honoured to, to be on Ghana country, even though I'm up in the sky opposite in self ISO, thanks to COVID, not. Um, but yeah, I'm very honoured to be on Ghana Country and for them, their hosting of this amazing event. Um, I'm a Trawalwe woman, so my people are from Tebrakuna, the far northeast of Lutruwira, Tasmania. So that's um, where we were um, irrevocably um, disrupted is a very safe term for that. We, we were um, removed from country um, by colonists that started to arrive in the 1790s. Uh, to hunt seal and take our women, our ancestors, our matriarchs. And uh, uh, my family come from uh, of strong women, such as Ali described herself for her own people. And by, by the 1840s and since, we've lived in the region of La Trobe and Devonport in the northwest of La Truida. I live in Hobart, Nipaluna, the land of the Mawinana, who didn't survive British colonisation. And I work in an institution. Um, I'm on leave at the moment because I think it's actually, yeah, it is damaging and dangerous to kind of maintain um, a sense of self within uh, non-Aboriginal institutions. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's interesting to reflect right now while I'm on leave about um, what you can do within them and then how to kind of... Um, self-care and and return back to the fray really I suppose thinking what trying to re, re, kind of constantly remember and apply yourself to the work that needs to be done but um on to, on to the project I suppose the um I was really fortunate to be invited to to um participate in in uh, Tanandi last year and um my screen sorry and Psychoscape was, um, it came up from great conversations with um, Nikki, Gloria, Lisa, the team, the team in, in the gallery. Uh, and the, it was because I'd created the a year or two years earlier, uh, an exhibition on my home country uh, called Tense Past, which was about how to, how to, kind of show our our history through through collections that are held in institutions uh, and what what that you know might what's possible what that tangled web might mm. might enable us to do with through working in in what's been collected about us that has been made by us uh, represents us apparently some of these objects so uh, maybe I'll, I'll read some I made some sort of notes so I don't go too far off topic so I, I, uh, Psychoscape, is, it was a kind of a museum or a gallery within the Art Gallery of South Australia um, in last year. And it was a, a window into what we've inherited from Van Diemen's land that still haunts us, Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people living on Lutruwida, Tasmania. Um, and it reset the meaning and the regular relationships of objects and collections and demonstrated their potential to be rearranged to tell another story and perspective than that which is given by the institution usually. Um, I I felt, I'm not sure if you're looking through, if you're seeing the images there. We've just got uh, the so main slide out. Can you see oh, it? Yeah, yeah we can move you, through, move through yeah, to yeah, maybe yeah, the install. You just rotate them because it doesn't quite matter Great. which, which can one. Can you see does. them, Julie, or not? No. Um, no, no. So, so we can no. see the the stills from the video of the waterfall. Maybe you want to talk about the red sure. and the and the landowner. Yeah, more. So, yeah. I'll, maybe I'll read a little tiny bit more about the the, the premise of the whole thing, which is um, I wrote the Vandemonium furniture and the artworks in each state gallery collection are a provocation. Each piece professes some kind of expertise or relationship with country and comfort of inhabitation upon it. Um, the Art Gallery of South Australia had a chair, a sewing table, a couch, a box, a table, a sideboard, enough to furnish a large room with a new narrative 
And then there are the portraits, landscapes, the watercolours, the oils, the sketches and the prints that become new views, instructional windows to anticipate and reform the world outside in the image of this imagined idol, you know, this perfection that the colonists sought to represent the, their place and ownership of our country. So each piece, each of these pieces that end up in the various institutions around Australia, it iterates a colonisation and a reinscribing of history and the forging of new ancestries upon our unceded Aboriginal lands. So these what, um, are in the, the images of the, of the room psychoscape. So I was fortunate to have a whole room to kind of reinterpret collection objects that are both and unusually for state collection uh, exhibition, I was able to infiltrate with my own private collection objects, or, but also um, those held within the Art Gallery of South Australia. So uh, this is a little bit more of my statement. Uh, these objects forever map the encroach of colonists upon my home country, while standing then also for our dislocation, exile, banishment, loss, absence, Yet still here, we wander these halls of colonial representations and perspectives, almost ghosts in their machine, where our ancestors are reduced, avoided or eliminated. So there's this always this extreme tension in working in such a site, which is all about celebrating our dispossession and our loss and um, always like um, celebrating through the paintings in particular, but everything made from our country, from our timbers, from the trees from those views, those vistas in the paintings um, of, of the land that um, people, the newcomers, the colonists took. So the painting um, on, when there's the uh, image of the red um, still of the projection of the waterfall, that's a place called the Falls of Clyde. The Clyde River is um, the ridiculous Western name applied to the river. It runs through a town called Bothwell, which so our whole island, Lutruwita, has been renamed um, as Scotland and England and Ireland. So that's, um, and it's all mashed together in this sort of unholy mess, like nothing is associated with where it would have been back in England, Scotland or Ireland. But we should have to wade through these layers of renamings and um, to try to piece together from the fragments what is our country, what remains of it, and how much can we be on it when we're fenced out by so many um, colonists still existing land grants. So to respond to the collection, my, I wanted to visit the places that were in the paintings held in the archive South Australia. So the Falls of Clyde painting um, by Von Gerard that uh, took some work and negotiation to locate and um, gain access and the, the video <clears throat> Uh, works through various, um, there's various screens and it becomes more and more degraded and finally runs blood red, the, the, the waterfall. When I uh, took some months to um, access that, to go to that place and the <clears throat> current land holders, it was so, this is all about really demonstrating how much work is required to, to um, it's a, there's a the work of healing that Ali mentioned of it's a country needs so much work and and so do we but we need to also do it together and then there is always that that, that three percent the fact that we do need allies and more and more landholders are opening gates but even so they are um, showing their um, perhaps guilt perhaps um, having to self reflect on on what they what they hold. Um, I was, uh, it was took quite a long time. And when I finally um, said, look, I need to, to come now to this place, um, I, it was because they had been doing undertaking uh, land, ma land management to try to make it look like the painting uh, because it had been so overgrown and um, covered in, in gorse and willows that um, they became embarrassed. And so that's why they were delaying my, my visit. So um, that, that's the painting, the painting next to the chase and the, um, the red waterfall image you can see and the stills. That... <clears throat> but also that, that... That... Sorry, Julie, keep going. I was that just going to say that... we've got that up now. 
and oh, we're yeah. also just looking at the the dist the view of the that kind of western wall as you walk in where you've got the video the painting and the furniture all talking to each other <coughs> and the spears yeah. of course the spears yeah so that that sort of array that sort of still life that um that wall presents was it's a commentary on various things that so for example the chair on the far left is known as a jimmy possum chair in the collection of the art gallery and uh it's it's one of these sort of mythological stories that uh jimmy the original jimmy possum was an aboriginal man that lived in a hollow tree near Deloraine in the north of our island and uh a lot of a lot of these stories are almost well after the fact wish i think wishful thinking by colonists as 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 well for some sort of some sort of stories of, of our survival against the odds when so many of us were our families exiled to Bass Strait and um, the decimation was um, so severe, you know, that our near genocide. So um, I kind of feel like they've applied this story to this furniture piece to kind of create some sort of positive fairy tale about this man that of which there's no um, real evidence or suggestion he was an Aboriginal man, but the Next to it, the small table is is um was actually a prop piece made for the movie The Nightingale. So that came from Westbury, which is near, you know, on the same journey to Deloraine and onto where my family have lived since the 1840s. So there's this sense of like accumulating for me and re re reinstating us, but also these question marks I have about collections and what point they have and what their use has been for um, the mainstream once they enter the sort of state collections in particular. The spears, uh, yeah, I make spears, I throw spears. There's um, also um, clear stories of Aboriginal women on our island being expert at throwing spears, in particular in the Northwest at uh, colonists on horses. There's one great story of, of um, the accuracy of the woman throwing a spear and going through the hat of a colonist on a horse. Um, I maybe, <clears throat> should I, I better at answering questions probably or I'll just go off, I'll speak for hours. Oh, you, you're doing <laughs> magnificently well. It's absolutely enthralling. I'm going to throw to Gloria for a minute because you've already implied, Julie, that the kind of collaboration and working together is really important. And I'm just curious from, if Gloria is speaking from, the institution's perspective she yeah. was the curator that helped open the doors of the collection and helped um you know for instance bring together the intermingling that julie spoke of as rare between her objects her works of art and the works in the collection do you just want to talk to that gloria and julie jump in too by the way because you work so closely together covid of course facilitate <coughs> it's ironic isn't it that we're here doing this via covid too julie because covid at the time meant that both Gloria and Julie were also communicating via Zoom and other digital means. Usually we would have literally had Julie in the house um, w working physically through the collection, but that had to be done by proxy really because of COVID. Can you talk to that for us? Sure. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Ali and Julie. I also want to acknowledge that I live and work on Ghana country and I'd like to pay my respects to elders past, present and those emerging and to other Aboriginal people and Torres Strait Islander peoples here in the room today. So thank you. Um, I totally forgot that we were installing this during COVID and I now I'm remembering how important it was to have Julie on um, you know, FaceTime. Julie, do you remember doing that? I totally forgot. I feel like the last two years has been some sort of vortex, but um, me sending photos to Julie, do you like it this way or, you know? Um, but yeah, I think for um, the work that we do at the Art Gallery of South Australia, it is very much about an accessible collection, um, openness and obviously, um, you know, an open heart and trust and building on relationships. And obviously um, I came into this project where Big swap. Um, when Nikki Cumston and Lisa had already had a relationship with Julie and, um, you know, working with Julie over many other projects. So, you know, um, 
thinking about not only the work that we do at the gallery across exhibitions such as Tarnandi, but thinking of this idea of decolonisation or decolonising institutions runs across the whole gallery. So from the work we do in education to marketing or media and registration teams and having those open conversations. Um, so with this project, it was very much, um, I guess, for my for my role in this project was really opening up and being that bridge to the colonial collection. Even though I work with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander um, works of art, this was very much about opening up the colonial collection and making sure that artists are able to um, give voice to those pieces and really tell truths through those um, works. Julie, we're just looking at the Lyset um, watercolours and mm. the brown, uh, brown bess, isn't it? Um, and your 24-hour <laughs> surveillance of your front yard, which maybe you can talk to <laughs> later. But, you know, how astounding it was, you know, looking at these colonial watercolours over many years and learning from you, Julie, that the Lyset representations of uh, New South Wales always had an Aboriginal presence. But the... Tasmanian watercolours only had the brown bess throughout them, you know. That was real truth-telling for me looking at that collection and realising, you know, some hidden stories and subsumed histories, I guess. Yeah, it's, and <clears throat> it was really, yeah, for me it's been just a, a way to bring to, into that room and it is a psychoscape for me because it, it is it was supposed to be very disorientating and yeah, destabilizing. So the um, the the gun, the brown bits, I actually um, purchased it as. I mean, these are these are. It's it's really kind of tricky to know what to do when when. But it became. It is the main gun of empire, and it was the main firearm on our island against our people. It's. I just uh, felt it needed to be beside the license with the. Yeah, which all show the um, firearms everywhere throughout this series. I think it's 21 showing Van Diemen's Land, um, 1821 watercolours, and they kind of map the journey of Governor Macquarie. Uh, he made two visits in 1810 and 1821 um, to our island as uh, he was like the leader of the, the colony of uh, Van Diemen's Land and gave instructions to, because Van Diemen's Land... Or, Luchawida, our island was under the command of New South Wales till 1825. So um, he, he, you know, the master of, of massacre on these two visits, um, which it, his ongoing work to try to understand how much he influenced colonists in picking up these guns and, and using them against us. But given his check record in, in New South Wales, I'd say there'd be, it would be um, qu quite substantial influence that he made on the colonists. So it just these are all elements to suggest that we keep we keep looking and we will find the mechanisms of of colonization the mechanisms of empire upon us and that these can be utilized in in in, our, in um our rightful claims for return of country and to be the caretakers of our own cultural material that are culture, uh, co currently held in in um, non aboriginal institutions around the world that we we um, can utilize these as evidential artifacts, the artworks, the records of of uh, empire held in archives, as Ali spoke about, and 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 utilize these as well as what country tells us when we're on it, which is also about this access that is um, you know incrementally becoming easier to achieve, but only if we behave ourselves, which is. Um, extremely frustrating because we, um, this this um, having to contain ourselves is is uh, is unhealthy to to try to <clears throat> redress and and um, gain gain back what is rightfully ours. So yeah, the, I'm just utilizing what are in the collections to try to show a, another perspective, which is the, my perspective on on uh, our history and how it can be found outside of our island, such as in Adelaide, you know, um, these are really, um, I think, valuable and reverberating collections. It strikes me as so kind of absurd and perverse and powerful that you were in 
Lutruwita working within a collection, the TMAG collection, whilst kind of interrogating the AGSA collection of representations of Lutruwita and then creating, as you said, a kind of museum within a museum. And what you guys in the room can't get a sense of from these slides is that it was indeed a psycho space. It was completely destabilising. You felt unwell when you entered the space. It was, as Julie said so eloquently, I think you are one of the most eloquent artists I've ever spoken to, Julie Goff. You, it was completely like sickening space because it was a crime. Is it is a crime scene? Lutruwita is a crime scene, is what you said. And so the image on the ground that you can see projected there was moving the entire time, and there was a rumbling soundscape that created that sense of being ill at ease. Yeah. Now, we've only got a couple of minutes left, so I'm going to throw to Ali and then back to Julie because I feel like you've got a question for Julie. And can I just shout out to how the two of you have been such an inspiration and you mentioned Julie's influence on your early work, but I just think you've, for future generations of artists and scholars and thinkers and activists, you are truly inspiring. Thank you. Julie, I was just thinking about... Um when I was writing about this work for you and just, well, thinking about the massacre mapping that's happening out of the University, uh, Lyndall Ryan's work out of the University of Newcastle um, and how we've been teaching that. So, you know, she's going into the primary source archives, all of the whatever, and finding out. And this map is growing. And it's an interactive map. Anyone can go on there. But when I... I teach about it, I also teach about it with your work, Julie, because it is so much about you You are always going outside, you know, you are always going back to these places. You are like, you, you know, this detective work that you do as a historian but also uh, an archivist and, an, um, you know, someone who is interacting with the country and... And imagining something else, you know, as, you know, people, uh, uh, Tracy Moffat, you know, describes this. Imagining something else. Imagining um, how we might begin to have those conversations. Because the conversations that we have in the present are really important. And students aren't studying history necessarily mm. at school. If it's taught boringly, dry... They roll their eyes, they go, eh. So you have to think about how we're going to tell the stories because the stories are important. These stories, these histories need to be reckoned with on so many levels in so many ways and we need to be able to own those things and learn from them. So I feel as though that's your gift, you're this gift of reckoning, yeah. You know, and that we all can reckon with things. We can struggle with them. We can um, – and that – and I talk about it as collective weight-bearing, you know, this idea of even if it's just – if you are an Aboriginal person in this this colony and you know that other people know your histories as well, then there is a collective weight-bearing of that. You don't feel alone. You don't feel like you're going mad, surrounded by people who look at you like you're a stranger and they have no idea where they are. They have no idea what's gone on there. So I feel as though that that's that work, Julie, and I just wanted to um, thank you for your... Yeah. Absolutely. And everyone here, amazing. Thank you, Ali. Thank you. I, this You can't see this work today. This work is something else at the moment at the Art Gallery of South Australia in this space. So the institutional challenge is how to keep this there because I think the great risk, speaking from the institution for a moment, is that we don't – this story doesn't remain present. It's a little bit like the invisible well, that's or the right. hidden history. When we think about – and I'm going to go back to the Art Gallery of New South Wales, which Chloe yes. helped in 2019 um, – we went to the, national. to the National and Chloe Bullen was working at the MCA but curating across Carriage Works, the Art Gallery of New South Wales and um, we chose the colonial wing of the Art Gallery of New South Wales which is above what was the primitive gallery which was really literally the primitive gallery where they kept the primitive artefacts and the primitive 
who knows? And so the floorboards are really creaky and it's an uninterrupted colonial narrative. It's the Heidelberg School, it's Shearing the Rams, it's Pioneers Lost in the Woods. They've it's done some work recently, but it was probably on the back of this intervention, Ali. But I don't, I just think, just keep the racist texts there in situ and let's interrupt them continually. Because um, that is the racist narrative. That is the construct. This was the YouTube of the day. It was the paintings, and they were promulgating a particular narrative which is nothing to see here. In fact, where are the Aboriginal people? They're all gone. Oh, how sad. Um, but, you know, there was no... And that was what I studied in the 1990s at school when I studied art, the Heidelberg School. So we, we got to project resistance poetry onto their painting <laughs> in, in skirts covered in gum leaves which had been secretly... Um, fumigated so that we didn't bring any bugs in to the national treasures but we looked like we just walked out of the bush <laughs> and the presence of Paracofi's cook and I know that there yeah. was a whole lot of work that went behind that to make that look as though it was our, our activism but it was the activism of the institution as well and the activism from within and you know like I asked Aileen Morton Robinson about this last year Audre Lorde wrote you can't dismantle the master's house with the master's tools. But in some ways, we try to do that because we just do. And, you know, and within institutions, everyone can push back. Everyone can. Thank you. Final words to you, Julie Goff. We've got about two minutes remaining. Thank you. You've been amazing. I can't believe – can you believe, Julie, that she can't see us all in this room, but you've just been so powerful. Thank you. Well, I just um, – Ali, what you said about that we, we're not alone in power in numbers. You know, we are a giant community of creatives, Aboriginal creatives, that 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 can give us that power and energy to keep going and also, yeah, touch base with each other. It's so important. Um Oh, what to say really in closing. We've got that time. Be... I reckon we've got time for like one question maybe, one or two questions from the room. Yep, do that. Yep, there's one over someone's pointing. Yep. I've got a mic. That's what you're pointing to. Sorry. <laughs> Any questions in the room? 